We've been in this series that we have called Mind Games, and we're talking about the thoughts and how they take over our life. How many of you guys grew up enjoying a good word problem? Okay, a couple of you guys. The rest of you are my people. You guys did not raise your hand. Like when you're in school, why in the world is Johnny buying 20 gallons of milk, a couple of lemons, and then some watermelons to go on the side. And then you have to figure out why you didn't grab something else or why this number and that. Like it never makes sense to me why we're worried about what little Johnny is doing with his milk. If he wants to buy 20 gallons of milk, then let him buy 20 gallons of milk. I don't know why I have to care about that. I never understood the mind games that we had to play in math. Math, when I look at it, I'm like, I, I don't understand these these are just, it's a whole nother language to me. Listen, and you think I'm joking, ask my wife. She will tell you that I struggle to add two and two together. Sometimes it equals five if I'm not really focused. I'm just telling you right now. It, the, the mind will play games on you if you're not focused on where you're going or what you are doing. And that's what we've been talking about over the past several weeks with Pastor Jason and Victor doing an incredible job to get us to this point, and we're going to conclude things today, but I want to kick things off with our key verse that we've been going over every single week. It's Romans 12, 2, and it says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve that God, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect, and perfect will. Do not conform to the patterns of this world. There's a lot of crazy stuff that goes on in our world, right? I think all of us would agree with that. There's a lot of crazy things that are either good, bad, or different, and everything in between is confusing and we don't understand it. And what society would want us to do is to say, just go with the flow. Don't even think about it. Don't worry about it. But this verse is saying, hey, no, we need to stop and we need to think about it. Because if we just continue to go with the flow, if we just continue to try to do what everybody else is doing, guess what? We're going to end up in the same place that everybody else is ending up. And I want to live a life with clarity. I want to live a life of peace. I want to live a life of joy, right? I want to live a life of love. And that only comes from when we transform our mind and we focus in on the things of God. Our main thought that we've been talking about is your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. What comes into your mind tends to to come out in your life. Or what uh, another way of saying that might be garbage in, garbage out, right? How many of y'all know uh, as much as I love eating Taco Bell, it's not the greatest thing for me to continue to be putting in my body. And some of you guys laugh. You guys don't understand how much I actually love Taco Bell. My wife gets a little bit annoyed. She's like, you want to go to Taco Bell again? You just had it last night. I was like, listen, it's good. I don't know what to tell you. I was not feeling great earlier this week. And, uh, you know, on the way home, I had gone into work and I was like, no, I need to go home and I need to rest. I need to try to sleep this off, whatever it is. And, I, I, you know, I wasn't feeling great. And the one thing that sounded good, Taco Bell. <laughs> so what did I get? Taco Bell. And then I took me a good nap, woke up feeling much better. So, you know, maybe it is good other than the other side effects that we don't need to get into uh, from consuming Taco Bell. Garbage in, garbage out. And if I continue to put negative thoughts in my life, my life will continue to project negativity. How many of you guys know those people that they just can't seem to think of one thing positive? Their whole life is like, oh, this is so terrible. Oh, did you see that on the news? That's so terrible. I can't believe that. That's terrible. You're like, I can only spend about this much more time before I think that you're just terrible. All right? And so we don't want to be those people. We want to put the positive thoughts into our life. And it's not like Pastor Victor talked about. It's not necessarily ignoring the, the negativity that's going in our life, but it's fixing our thoughts back on the one that created us, that called us, that shaped us, and can place everything where it needs to go in our life. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, it says this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that it sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive our thoughts. We grab a hold of our thoughts. Your thoughts in your brain are not just up there willy-nilly, just doing whatever they want, going wherever they please. No, we have to take time and we have to focus on what we're thinking. And listen, there may be a time where it's like a negative thought pops in our mind and we say, no, I'm not going to think that way. I'm going to think this way. No, I'm going to reshape what I'm thinking so that it looks more like Christ. I want every part of me to look more like Christ. I don't want Christ to start looking more like me, which I think a lot of times we do in Christianity. 
We pick up the Bible and we read the words that God put in there. We read the life of Jesus and we say, oh, that's great, uh, but uh, I'm not really ready to deal with this yet, so I'm, I'm not going to worry about that. We're just going to move on from that one. Oh, I don't really agree with this, so, so we're just going to worry about that. And we try to make the Bible, Jesus, fit into our life when in reality there should be no part of us that is an exception. There should be no part of us that is left to the side. Every part of our life should, give, uh, should be given back to God as worship and praise and an offering. Saying, God, I, I, listen, I've tried things my way. I've gone this, down this path. I've done it this way. And now I'm focusing on you. I want to take my thoughts captive. We have the power through Jesus to not allow our worry to control every moment of our life when we take our thoughts captive. You have the power to not worry in your life. And some of us in the room, when I said that, they automatically, you were like, Caleb, you don't get it. Some of us deal with anxiety on such a high level that you're like, Caleb, you don't understand. There's no way that you know what I'm walking through. I, I've always worried. I've always dealt with anxiety. And so I'm always going to deal with it. It's just part of my life, which is the lie that the world and the enemy wants you to believe. I am so grateful that we have uh, therapists and counselors to talk to through and work through our anxiety I love Dr. Josh Williams. He's helped me out so much since I've started talking with him, and we've been working through things, and he's been a godsend for me. And one of the things that I have learned through talking with Dr. Josh is that I don't have to live with anxiety for the rest of my life. I don't have to live with worry for the rest of my life. It may be a moment in time, but we have the power to overcome that by putting in the work, by taking our, cap our, our thoughts captive. So here's what, uh, if you're taking notes today, and you should be, because note takers are... Good job. Listen, I heard more than just teenagers saying that. We're getting good, guys. Great job. I like it. If you're taking notes, and you should be, the title of my message today is, My Worry Won't Defeat Me. My Worry Won't Defeat Me. Some of us in the room, maybe you're even watching online, you have dealt with anxiety from a very young age. You, you've had thoughts that have literally taken you down the rabbit hole of life. Maybe when you were younger, it was like the stress of school. And if, man, if I don't get good grades, then I can't get into college. And if I can't get into college, then, then I'm not going to get a good job. And if I don't get a good job, then I'm probably not going to meet the person that I'm supposed to marry. And if I don't meet that person, then, then I'm not going to have kids. And if I meet the wrong person, then, then we're going to have kids and the kids are going to end up awful. And then maybe one day that kid is going to end up in jail and I'm going to have to pay, you know, bail. And I don't even know if I've got the money for bail. And then, you know, all of these things are going to happen. And you're like six years old. None of that's even happened yet. Yet we do that all the time. We go down the rabbit trail, well, if I, if I say this to this person, they're going to think this, and then that's going to happen, and this is going to happen. Well, if I go to this place, then they're going to think this, and, and that person, this is going to happen. And it, con it constantly confuses us and frustrates us to the point that it becomes debilitating. And we allow our worry of diagnosis and what people are saying to control our thoughts way more than the things that Jesus has already spoken over our life. And what... Our goal over this series has been to help us realize, to get to the point where we can stop what we're doing and realize that the promises of God are yes and amen, which means that if he said it, then it's done, and that's all we have to do. That's all we have to know. I don't care what the world looks like. I don't care what your situation looks like. It's not bigger than the God that I serve. I know things look difficult right now. I know they look tough right now, but I promise you that I serve a good God who comes through in the end every single time. Amen? Amen? Your worry doesn't have to defeat you. It doesn't have to constantly be your reality. We can look in the Bible in Philippians, and, and, and Pastor Victor talked about this verse last week, and it's the Apostle Paul who's writing here. And the, the crazy thing about the book of Philippians, he's writing to the church in Philippi, and he's writing this book in the Bible from a jail cell. And he's talking about the things of God from jail, even though he didn't do anything to deserve to get thrown into jail. The one thing that he did to, to possibly deserve to be thrown into jail was to go out and preach the gospel. 
was to tell people the good news that, hey, listen, nobody else in your life loves you, but guess what? God loves you. Hey, you might have messed up before, but guess what? God forgives you, and he sees you, and he sees you right where you're at. There's a hope, a plan, and a future for you through Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that Paul ever did, and he got thrown into jail. I don't know about you. I've never been thrown into jail. Knock on. I, I, hopefully, I don't ever get thrown into jail. I, you know, I don't plan on it at least. I don't know. And we'll, see what, we'll, we'll see what happens this week. Maybe it's just a fun field trip. I don't know. I've never been thrown into jail. But I can guess that especially if I got thrown into jail for something that I didn't do, I'm not going to be real happy about it. I'm not going to be standing there and be like, oh, God, you're so good. Thank you for this. This is amazing. No, I'm going to be like, God, what the heck are you doing? I'm a pastor. I do good things, right? Like, I'm going to start questioning things. But Paul, he's sitting here, and he's writing this book, and it's just simply saying, hey, let's look back to God. Don't, don't worry about the, the things that are happening around you. God's got you exactly where you're at. And in chapter 4, verse 6 through 9, it says this, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then God of peace will be with you. Man, that's some pretty strong words from a guy who could be complaining about everything. Fixate on what is good and honorable and godly. And the things in our life that feel chaotic and stressful, when we focus on the things that God is doing in our life, the good blessings that God has already given us, they don't feel so big anymore. I mentioned it earlier, uh, but worrying about things in our life that you can't control, because let's be honest, we don't ever really worry about the things that we can control, right? Because if we can control it, we don't need to worry about it. If I know the plan that I need to take to do all these things, why do I need to worry about it? It's already done. I've got it taken care of. So we worry about the things that we can't control. And uh, worrying about things that we can't control is a lot like yelling at your TV on a Sunday, the plays to Coach Andy Reid on the sideline and saying, hey, Coach Andy, run this play and I promise you we're going to get a touchdown. Some of you guys are crazy enough out there to think that. Let's just be honest. It's okay. You love football. We get it. It's good. Go Chiefs. But he ain't hearing you. Even if you were right next to him, let's also be honest. He probably ain't going to listen to you anyway. And that's a lot what we do when we worry in life. We try to, to worry about, we stress, and we say, hey, if, we, if only this could happen, if only that could happen. Well, what if this goes this way? And what if that happens? And all it does is leave our stomach in knots, leave our heart broken, leave our mind clouded and confused. When all we can do is simply stop and say, God, I don't really know what's going on. God, I don't know how this is happening. God, I don't know what's going to come of this, but I know that you are a good God. I know that you always come through. I know what your promises say about my life, so I'm going to stand on those, and I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to believe that the best is still to happen in my life. Worrying doesn't get us anywhere in life. If anything, all it does is hold us back. Because we're so worried about making the wrong decision, so worried about making the wrong choice, so worried about this certain outcome that we have no control of, that all it does is flood our mind, that we lose track of everything else that's going on in our life. And life is so beautiful that God doesn't want us to miss any part of it. And so here, as we go through the rest of this, we're going to get... We're going to get pretty practical with some stuff. And I, as I was, I was reading through this uh, this week and I was studying, uh, I found out some interesting information. Um, and I, I was not a, uh, what you would call a good student uh, when I was in high school. Um, my parents are in the room. They can attest to that. Uh, I was good enough to get through high school and I graduated. And they said, okay, good job. You did it. Great job. Uh, but uh, we, I, there wasn't very many A's on my, port, on my report card. I'll just say it that way. Except for PE, that was always an A, okay? I was great in PE. Uh, but I, I, as I've gotten older, I've, I've enjoyed studying a little bit more than I did in high school. And as I was studying this week about worrying and, and what it does to our brain, 
uh, I found this part that I never learned in school, or maybe I did, and again, I just didn't pay attention. Uh, but there is a part in our brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is an almond-shaped part of your brain, and it's the part of your brain wired for survival. It's the fight-or-flight piece of your brain. Anytime you're in danger, it kicks in and it sends your body adrenaline. It's a fight or flight. So it's when you're in a moment of, of panic and chaos, it's the adrenaline that kicks on and you say, well, what do I need to do? Where do I need to go? It's actually a good thing. How many of you guys played sports growing up and you got a little bit of nerves right before the game? And what happened a lot of times, maybe not everybody, but, but a lot of times when those nerves kick in, you, you actually get locked in a little bit better. The adrenaline kicks in, and it's actually a good thing, that worry, that anxiety that kicks in. It's actually helping you focus. It's helping you realize where I need to go. But the problem with the amygdala is that it doesn't take a break. The amygdala is not objective. It is simply hardwired to protect. And so what happens is the amygdala, it kicks in any time and moment that we feel like something's happening, something's going on, something's going to happen. Or maybe it's something that already happened and it's, we're reminded of that moment. Maybe it's when like a person comes and talks to you and you're like, oh, I, I, I can't be around them. I can't talk to them. I can't, I can't handle that. Or you go past a certain place. Uh, there was a couple years ago um, that uh, Alyssa and I and Carter, uh, that we were driving uh, to our niece's birthday party. And our, our building in Independence that we have here at the church, the, the Valley Celebration Center, uh, that was where the birthday party was at. And so um, it had snowed and iced and stuff that weekend, but the roads were pretty much clear by the time that we got going. Um, and so we're, we're heading down, if you guys know anything about heading down uh, Little Blue, uh, where it intersects with 40 Highway right there. Um, and we're, so we're heading down that hill. There's a car wash over here to your right. And I'm in the, I'm in the far lane. And uh, we're driving, and out of nowhere, we hit a patch of ice that I couldn't see and I wasn't expecting. And so what happened is it, 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 it sent our car flying across all four lanes of the highway, went over the median, and we ended up in a ditch across the way. And now luckily, praise God, everybody was safe. I look back at Carter, and he's like, yeah, that was fun. Let's do it again. I'm like, no thanks, bud. We're good. Uh, but it was, a, it was a panic moment. I look over at my wife and, you know, her eyes are real big and praise God for my wife because she like locked in on what we needed to do, make sure everybody was okay. I'm over here like, I didn't mean to, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, we're, we're driving and we go and we, this happens and we crash and again, luckily everybody was fine and everybody was okay. Uh, but now, even to this day, this has been three years since this happened, maybe, maybe four, I can't even remember now what the t actual timeline was. Even to this day... During the summertime, every time that I drive down that hill, especially when my family's in the car, I grip the wheel just a little bit tighter. Not that that's actually going to help. In fact, that probably is going to make things worse if something were to go on. But even to this day, it, it's still just something that kicks in. And I'm like, oh, I forgot about this. You know, whatever. I drive it every single day. And every single day, it's not necessarily like a great panic, but there's something that kicks in on, hey, be alert. And that's the amygdala. It's kicking in, even though there's no danger, again, especially during the summer where there's no ice on the road. I don't have to necessarily be worried about that. The amygdala kicks in and tells me, hey, alert, 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 alert. It's like when you're up in the middle of the night and your alarm goes off and you're in a dead sleep and you pop up and you're like freaking out because you don't know what's going on. Uh, when, I, when, when Crew was born uh, a couple months ago, we were in the hospital the first night there and uh, you know, as guys, you guys know this, how much hard work we have to put in uh, when a baby's being born. I'm just kidding, ladies. Please don't kill me. You guys are amazing superheroes. I, I don't mean that at all. Uh, but uh, uh, we get into our, our room, finally get settled, and uh, my wife uh, can attest to this. I was out. Like, I was out cold. I was laying on that really super comfortable couch that they have in there, uh, and uh, I was just, I was out. And uh, Crew, I, you know, so Car Carter is five years older than Crew, and so it's been several years since we've had a baby, and you, you forget all of the noises that babies make, even though they're fine, there's nothing happening to them, um, but I, I was sleeping, and I don't know if he fully cried or just made a noise or whatever, but I was laying there, and I pop up, and I'm like, what's going on, what's happening, where are we at? I had thought that somebody came into our room and took Crew out of the room. And Alyssa was like, what are you doing? And I'm just holding, like she's just holding crew in her arms. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I thought someone, she goes, would you just go back to sleep, right? Like she was like, would you just knock it off? You're obnoxious right now. 
And so I go back to sleep and everything was fine, obviously. But that was the part. It was the panic. It was the, the anxiety that kicked in that said, I've got to do something. There's something happening. Now, luckily... We don't just have our amygdala to kind of transform our thoughts and see the world. And if we always lived on edge and, and not knowing what was going on, we also have what is called the prefrontal cortex. And that's where that kicks in. The prefrontal cortex is the logical part of the brain. When you hear a noise uh, in the middle of the night, you're in your room, you're all snuggled up, it's great, you're already warm, and you hear a, n- a noise come from the hallway or the kitchen, and you're like, what's that? Right? The amygdala kicks in. The prefrontal cortex then kicks in and says, no, there's nothing there. It's probably just the cat or it's just the, you know, the pipes that constantly make noise or whatever it is. The thing that you know that your house already does. And so then you calm back down and you you can go to sleep. And without that prefrontal cortex, we would be in a panic mode all the time. But what that helps us do is it helps us shape our thoughts so that we can see clearly and make clear decisions to take captive the thoughts of our life. When our amygdala kicks in and we're like, I, what's going on? I don't know what's happening. Where I don't know where to go. I don't know what's doing this. Our prefrontal cortex it allows us to say, no, everything's fine. I need peace. I don't have to worry about that because I know exactly what is happening. Which is why it's so important that we learn the rhythms of our life. And it's so important that we learn to get rid of the anxious thoughts, the worry of our life, by allowing our our actual logical thoughts in our brain to kick in and not live so heavily on our anxiety. Philippians 4, 7 says this, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and minds as you uh, live in Christ Jesus. We take half our thought, I want peace in my life. I don't want craziness. I don't want chaos. I want peace that surpasses all understanding to help come in and comfort me. How do we take our thoughts captive? Have you guys ever thought about that? Like maybe we've been up here and we've been saying that like, cool, Caleb, we've heard it for the past several weeks. Take your thoughts captive. Like, that's awesome. That's great. How do I actually do that? We do that through prayer and petition. We do that by taking our worry, our needs straight to God, and then we do that through petition, meaning that we don't stop until we get the peace that we need. Sometimes I think for a lot of us in the room, what we've done is like, well, I prayed about it once, and God didn't show up. I prayed about it, but God, he didn't do anything, so I don't know. Maybe he just didn't hear me. Maybe he doesn't love me. Whatever it is. No, 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 no. The Bible says keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking. Keep chasing after the answers that you need. It may not happen today, but if we keep asking, we keep seeking after it, I promise you the answers will come. It may not always happen when we want it or how we want it, but I promise you the answers will come. Hebrews 4, 16 says this, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. Let us come boldly boldly to God. The beautiful thing that I love about serving Jesus is not him dying on the cross necessarily. I love that part. That's great. I'm glad that he did it so I get to spend heaven, uh, spend eternity in heaven. That's, that's incredible. But what I love about serving God is that I can come to him no matter how I'm feeling. I can come to him with, with anxiety. I can come to him with sadness. I can come to him with joy. And I can bring everything to him and I can lay it at the feet and I say, God, I know that you know exactly what I need. So here you go. I'm going to be bold about this. I'm going to be specific about this. Listen, our prayers sometimes are way too generic. God, I, 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 need, I need help today. Thanks. How do you need help? How do, you, how do you want me to show up? How do you want me to do this? We need to start getting specific with our prayers. Jesus, I keep thinking the same thought over and over again at this time, and I'm tired of it. I need you to step in and do something about it. Because I know that I've tried it my way. I know that I've done it this way forever, and it's not worked. So now I'm going to boldly, I'm going to bring this to you, and I'm going to expect that you can do what only you can do. It's time that we start living our life on the offense and not the defense. Prayer should be our first response, not our last. And what oftentimes happens in our life 
is that prayer, bad things happen, anxiety comes, there's pressure in our life, and we've not prayed at all throughout the week, and then we get to that moment, and it hits, and we're like, oh God, I don't know what to do, where are you at? Why, were, why have you not been here? It's time that we start living on the offense. When you, when you read in the Bible, and you hear about the armor of God, there's actually not one piece of that that helps you defend your back. Right? When you're in defense, sometimes you got a back pedal, sometimes you got a head back. There's nothing on there that's going to help defend your, your backside. No, everything that when you read about the armor of God in the Bible is all offensive driven. When I was in high school, uh, I played basketball, uh, and we ran a very special offense. It was a lot like hockey in the sense that we would uh, run for a minute, and then all five of us would get subbed out for a new five. It was a wild time. Uh, it was called the, the Grinnell offense. It's a college, I think, in Iowa, uh, smaller school. A guy that uh, played in this offense uh, that they ran there uh, scored over 100 points in a game. I think it was like 138 points uh, just not that long ago. And so it's a very high-powered, fast offense. Every seven seconds in this offense, we were told we needed to get a shot up. Seven seconds. Ball goes through the basket. We're, we, you know, on defense, we get the ball. And we're pushing it out, and we're going, and there either needs to be a three-point attempt or a layup. That was it. That's how we played. It was exhausting. Because not only were we playing our offense like that, but we were pressing the entire game. It didn't matter if we were down 50 or up 50. We were pressing. And when I played, we were oftentimes down 50, and so it wasn't very fun to continue to do that and get scored on. But when we were in practice, guess what? We didn't really practice all that much. We did, but very small amount. Defense. Guess what? We practiced a whole lot. Offense. We didn't really care how many points you scored. We just, we just knew or hoped or prayed or however you want to look at it that we were going to score more than you. Based on the amount of threes that we took, the amount of layups, how fast we could get moving and going, we just took the gamble, the bet, if you want to call it, that our offense was going to beat your offense. We worked on some defense, but it wasn't really as important as our offense. There was not very many teams that came through, especially while we were running this, that were known for their defense. But our offense got nationally recognized. We had a couple of guys who ended up going and playing Division I basketball that were, they broke a ton of records through this offense. It was a high-powered offense. And we would have got, especially our, our older teams, I was on the, the freshman and sophomore team when we, when we did this, but our varsity team, they, they were able to compete with some people and some teams that they had no business being in the gym with. But because they worked on the offense, they said, we're going to push ahead, we're going to score any time that we can, they were able to win some games that they, should have, that they had no business being in. And for a lot of us, we have lived on the defense, we've said, Okay, well, I'm just going to hunker down here and whatever happens, it happens, and I'm just going to hope and pray for the best. When in reality, God's saying, no, get out and run. Push the matter. When you get your shot, you take it. Stop living in worry. Stop living in anxiety and push the matter. Bring it boldly to me. Live on the offense and see what I can do. Any time that I have ever brought a request to God and I've been unsure about it, I've been, I've been uncertain. Every time that I've said, God, I don't know what's going on. I've tried everything else. Here you go. He's come through every time. Again, not necessarily in the timing that I wanted it or even how I wanted it. But I can look back in every single step of the way. In those moments where I was aggressive and I was, a, I was a living on the offense, God showed up in a big way. We have to understand that in order to take our mind captive, prayer has to become a major part of our life. Because what does prayer do? Prayer moves the heart of God, right? That's the spiritual aspect of it. When we pray and we petition and we're bold and we go to God and we pray, it, it moves the heart of God. Not that it's like, oh, I hear someone praying, I need to go over there and I need to see what they want. No, the Bible talks about that Jesus is with us all the time. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's closer than a brother. But what it is, is it's a heart matter. It's 
our heart gets so passionate about not worrying about the life anymore, not dealing with the anxiety that has stricken me, that's kept me in bed for the entire week. But now I'm taking it to God and say, God, I, I need you. It moves the heart of God. But not only does it prayer move the heart of God, but it actually changes our brain. For decades, it was believed that your brain did not change after adolescence. How many of you guys are grateful you still don't think the same way as when you were 15? Victor raised his hand. He still, he still thinks the way as when he was 15. I promise you he does. Some of you wives out there are like, yeah, so does this guy. I'm grateful that I still don't think the same way that I did when I was 15 years old. I am grateful that my brain has changed, that it has evolved. There's actually a study called neurotheology. And it's the study between the relationship between the brain and the belief in God. And research shows that, that prayer actually changes your brain. There's a doctor, Dr. Caroline Leaf, who wrote a book called Switch On Your Brain. She said this, it has been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. I don't know if anybody has ever had to, to go in and, and, and get a brain scan and you can kind of see the mapping of what's going on in it, but that's pretty significant that, that there's, if I'm praying, they can now be, be seen on the screen. I think sometimes we just think I'm praying, what am, what am I doing? What, what good is happening? Why am I doing this? But there's actually physical changes that are happening in our body when we decide that we're going to pray. Not only are you talking to God, but it's actually reshaping the way that we see our world. It's actually reshaping the thoughts that I have about my life. It's reshaping the thing that the doctor told me that I don't have to believe because I believe that I serve a good God. It's reshaping the way that, oh, that person talked bad about me, but guess what? I still see them as a child of God, so I'm going to forgive them, I'm going to love them, and we're going to move forward on this. It's reshaping the fact that I don't have to stay over here anymore. Why? Because God has called me to move forward in life. It's reshaping our thoughts. And when we pray, our prayer is the greatest attack against the things that we worry about. So if we know that, if prayer is the greatest thing that we worry about, then why do we still worry? Especially those of us in the room that you guys say, I'm Christian, I I've been doing this thing for a while. Why, why do we still worry? I think a lot of times we worry just to be honest. This is just, again, my opinion. I think we worry because we believe that it's not hurting anybody else. If I'm worrying, if it's my worry, then it has no effect on the people around me or my life. It's just, it's just for me to deal with on the inside. But here's what we don't know. Worry is actually the sin of distrusting the promises and power of God. So when we worry, here's what we're doing. God, I know better than you. When we worry, it's saying, God, I, I, actually, I actually know what I'm doing way more than you do. You created the heavens and the earth and all the animals, and you created me, and uh, you, you knew everything about my life. But in this one situation, God, you don't know what you're talking about. I know more way, way more than you know. Your worry has a greater effect on you than you could ever imagine. And listen, I don't say this just flippantly. I don't say this disrespectfully, I get it that there's people out here that are sitting right now, maybe listening on a line, who you have dealt with debilitating anxiety for years. And I see you and I hear you, and I'm just here to tell you that that doesn't have to be the rest of your life. That is not the promise of God. The promise of God is that you live and operate in peace that surpasses all understanding. Romans 8, 5 through 6, it says this, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So let your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But putting the Spirit control, uh, putting, by letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. I think sometimes when we hear the word, the Holy Spirit, we can often think about things that we saw when we were kids or stories that you've heard from other people, all the crazy stuff that can happen. We've been in a, a collection of talks uh, in our youth group that we've been talking about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit's plan and purpose for our life is and how it operates in our life and how we can read in the Bible and how that affects it. And listen, 
Here's what the Holy Spirit is in your life to do. It is to bring peace. It is to give purpose. It is to bring boldness and strength. How do you know that you're operating in the Holy Spirit? The fruits of the Spirit start to show. Joy, peace, faithfulness, love, kindness, self-control. Those things will start to be evident in your life. When you are operating in the Holy Spirit, peace just flows out of you. People will see you and they'll be like, man, what, how are you so How are you so calm right now? Do you know what's happening in your life? You're like, yep, sure do. It's not great. But guess what? God's got this. People will see you and be like, do you know what that person said about you? you should, are you worried about what they're going to say? Are you worried about what they're going to do? No. That's hurtful. That sucks. I'm, I don't like it. But God's got this. The Holy Spirit brings an overwhelming peace. And if we operate in the Holy Spirit, we'll have the strength to continue to push on daily. My, my concern for all of us at times in the room is that we live a life that looks at our God as small and our worries big. Here's, here's what we do. Is we look at our life in such a way where our worries that we deal with are so big and so great that we, we, we put God in this small box and we say, God, I, I'm not ready to let go of my worry. I'm not let, ready to let go of what's going on in my life. But, but you can still be a part of my life. You can, you, I'll fit you in here somehow, some way. And what happens is our worry just constantly consumes us. It constantly is shaping our thoughts and our mind. And so the point that we get to the point where we don't even know where we're at, what we're doing, or who we are. But here's where we need to get to. We need to get to the point where we are not so co controlled by the big worries that we have in our life. But we need to flip it and realize that we serve a big God. And when we trust this big God, your worries don't really matter all that much. Why? Because God wants to step into your situation and take control. Come on, can somebody give God some praise that he sees you right where you're at and he loves you. He loves you so much that you don't have to worry anymore. He wants to step right into your situation and take control. But we have to step boldly into the throne room of God and say, Jesus, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I I've got to give everything over to you. It's time to start telling your worry how big your God is. Stop worrying about how big everything else feels. I don't, I don't know how this is going to get paid. I don't know what's going to happen with this relationship. I don't know what this is going to look like tomorrow, but I know that I serve a big God. I know that he can do all things. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Jason brought this up, and it's never more true now than, than any other time in our life. Is we work like it depends on us, and we pray like it depends on God. We work like it depends on us. There are real things when you are dealing with anxiety and worry that you actually have to do. Right? Like, yes, prayer and petition is awesome, and that's great, but there are real things that God says, hey, I hear you. I see you, but now I need you to go and I need you to do the things on your own that you're supposed to do and that you're supposed to take care of. It, we got to work to get healing. We got to work. Not so that God loves us, not so that God sees us, not so that God he's, hears us, but we got to work in following the steps that God has placed before us. So here's how I want us to look at this, is, and we're going to throw this up on the screen, is I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to give to God what only I or what I can't do, and I'm going to trust God no matter what. I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to do my part, and then I'm going to believe that God on the stuff that I can't handle, that I can't, I can't fix, I don't know what's going on, I'm going to give that to him, and in the meantime, I'm just going to trust God that he knows exactly what's happening. I'm going to have faith that if my God said it, then it's done. What work do we need to do to get to that point so that we're not worried about the worry and the doubt and the anxiety? Maybe for some of us in the room, it's you need to go out and you need to forgive someone. 
You've been holding bitterness for way too long and it's all it does is build up anxiety. Anytime that phone rings and you see their name go across it, all it does is build up just stress and you're like, I don't wanna go there because I know that they're gonna be there. As soon as you leave today, do not wait. Go forgive. I see the hurt. I understand that it's real. I went through a season of my life just not that long ago where I was holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness for a very long time until I decided one day enough is enough. I'm forgiving them because I gotta move forward. Maybe you need to forgive someone. Maybe you need to seek counseling. Maybe you need to come hang out with us this week at our mental health conference. Listen, counseling, especially when you go to a Christian counselor, it is a godly thing where you can talk through past hurt, trauma, pain, and you can work through these things to get to an end result. And listen, the thing, again, the thing I love about Dr. Dr. Josh Williams is not that he's gonna be like, okay, well, you're gonna come see me and you're gonna do this for the rest of your life. No, he has an end goal in mind. He's like, hey, you have this many sessions and we should be working towards that to be so that you don't have to deal with this anymore. So it doesn't have to be forever. I think some of us, we've like, I don't wanna do that forever. You know, that's the money, whatever. Listen, you spend what you need to spend on to get healthy. We'll spend the money to go to a Chiefs game. We'll spend the, the three, 400, whatever it is to go to a Chiefs game. And I love the Chiefs. I love watching them play on Sunday, but your health is more important than you going to a Chiefs game. You worrying about the worry and the doubts and the anxiety that you have in your life is way more important than anything else that's going on. Why? Because it's holding you back from being who God wants you to be. I don't know what it is that you need to do. I don't know what you need to, to have happen in your life for you to start taking the steps that you need to take to get to where you need to go. But we have to put in the work. We have control over our thoughts and it's up to us what we do with it. Real practical here, steps that we can take this week to start believing the promises of God, to start believing that we're not going to deal with worry and anxiety for the rest of our life. Write it, think it, confess it, until you believe it. Come on, let's say that together. Write it, think it, confess it, until you believe it. One more time. Write it, think it, confess it. It may be a process. It may not happen overnight, but what I know is that my God is able and that he will never leave you nor forsake you in the middle of this process. He's there with us every single step of the way. Last verse before I close that I'm going to read, and this has been something that um, has has been near and dear to my heart lately. It's something that I've held on to very tightly lately. And so I, I just, I want to share it with you guys as we wrap up here today. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. And I love the way that it says this in the message version. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. That part right there. And I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. What I know in my life is when I have tried to force things out of the, for- the rhythm of grace, when I've tried to do things on my own, that's when my anxiety has become the highest. That's when my worry starts to, to, okay, well, what do I gotta do to fix this? What do I gotta do? Uh, as most guys is in here, we're, we're, we're fixers. Anytime that my wife comes to me and she's like, oh man, this happened in my day. I'm like, okay, well, who do I need to talk to? Who do I need to fight? Like, let's go, I'm, I'm taking care of this right now. But how do you guys know that there's a lot of things in life that there's just, it's out of your control and you can't fix it? So when I learn the unforced rhythms of grace and I start walking with a stride and a pace that God has set for me and I'm not striving my way through life hoping that I can get more, be more, be better, be stronger, whatever it is, and I can rest in the fact that Jesus has got me every single step of the way as where so much peace comes through. Are you tired? Are you worn out today? 
Has the anxiety of your life been debilitating? It doesn't have to be forever and it doesn't have to be your future. 